Let us pray. Grant, O Lord, that your word may be faithfully proclaimed, your word may be faithfully received, and your word may be faithfully made manifest in your world. Amen. God is still speaking. I've seen these words emblazoned on banners on United Church of Christ buildings across the country. And I even found it today on the wall of your senior pastor's office. And if you look very carefully, you will see that it does not end with a period, as if it was a statement unto itself, but rather with a comma, denoting an ongoing and yet not ended process. God is still speaking as God spoke in the past. Even so, God is still speaking now. And I should add to my surprise that on that poster in Darren's office is a quotation from of all people, Gracie Allen, who says, God never puts a period where there should be a comma. Now, depending on my mood, sometimes my reaction to this phrase can be rather cynical. Yeah, sure, right. But is anyone listening? And at other times, my response is one of curiosity. Has God really got something new to say? Especially about the myriad trials and tribulations that plague our lives and our world today? But then I remind myself that listening to God's voice, hearing God's message, understanding, interpreting, and applying it in our lives and to our world is an essential responsibility of people of faith. In the Bible, God spoke to Adam and Eve, to Moses and prophet, and I should have added Abraham too, to John the baptizer and Jesus, the apostles Peter and Paul, John on the Isle of Patmos. And throughout the centuries ever since, God has spoken to men and women of every nationality, race, and creed, even unto our own day. God is still speaking, which is why we study scripture, engage in meditation, attend classes for Christian development, theological education, pursue other activities, all in an effort to hear what God is saying. That is why we add to the end of each lesson we read in worship on Sunday, hear what the Spirit of God is saying to Christ church. God is still speaking today. And as people of faith, we need to be ready willing and able to listen to what God is saying, no matter how controversial the topic or uncomfortable the message. The significance of the banner's words, God is still speaking, I think is heightened. We remember that we are ordained clergy, preachers and religious spokespersons are charged with ensuring as much as possible that what we say is what God wants said. That expectation is the basis of the prayer that I've offered before every sermon I've preached for years. God is still speaking, and my responsibility is faithfully to listen for God's voice and proclaim God's inspired words. Yours is to faithfully heed God's message and ours together is to implement God's will for our lives and for the world God created. God is still speaking to you and to me as we faithfully, carefully, prayerfully listen for what is still often a very small voice. I have found this to be especially important for my advocacy for an end to gun violence in our country. In part because of the sensitivity 
and divisiveness of the topic and the depth of pain and uncertainty many feel every time another mass shooting happens. My responsibility is not to express my personal feelings, ideas, suggestions for strategy, or assumptions about how to address this troubling social issue. My responsibility in a situation like that is to share God's words of love, comfort, and assurance to those most affected by the mass shooting, and to, to convey God's understanding, expectations, judgments, and challenges to those responsible for causing the mass shooting or addressing its aftermath. Mass shootings, we all know, are happening with an ever-increasing frequency, each one followed by a predictable response, which results in nothing happening. Gun violence may be only one among many troubles plaguing our world today, but if it is the one that God has chosen to address, we as people of faith need to listen to what God is saying about it and bring that message to any discussion of the topic. Now, the modern era of gun violence began with the Columbine High School massacre in April of 1999. But I did not personally address the issue in a sermon until after this, the spree shooting at Virginia Tech in April of 2007. And it was not until the Sandy Hook Elementary School mass shooting in December 14, 2012, that I made a personal commitment to speak out against gun violence whenever and wherever I could, urging an end to this terrible cancer in our social body. And for over 10 years, I have lifted my voice or taken up my pen to address this topic, its activities, impact, and challenges, and the ability, inability of contemporary efforts to limit or stop it. And in so doing, I've learned a great deal about, what, about it while keeping before me two questions. What is God saying to us about gun violence? And am I reflecting God's eternal word and what I say related to that painful reality? Now, you know, there are two opposing sides addressing contemporary gun violence today, each having different and, and antithetical views on how to end the shootings. One is properly identified with the advocacy for gun control, and the other is affiliated with the National Rifle Association. Both sides have a lot of people, a lot of money, a lot of resources, political power, lobbyists, strategies, programs, and other activities, all aimed at ending gun violence. One by limiting the number of guns, and the other by increasing the number of guns. Mutual distrust defines their relationship, meaning that getting them to the same table, much less fostering a productive conversation between them, can seem an impossibility. In search, researching this sermon, I actually learned something I didn't know, that to both, but that both look to God, the Bible, and religion for their support for their individual positions. This is a little bit akin to the activities of slaveholders and abolitionists uh, before and during the Civil War that prompted Lincoln to say in his second inaugural address, both read the same Bible, pray to the same God, each invokes his aid against the other. The prayers of both cannot be answered, that of neither are being answered. Such a situation of necessity complicates any effort to introduce what God may be saying about gun violence into any conversation. Both sides in this ongoing conflict over guns in America are seeking the same thing, power. The power to determine how many guns should be available and owned, for what purpose, and by whom. 
neither is aware they need each other, gun owners and those seeking to limit ownership working together if they ever expect effectively to reduce or bring to an end mass shootings. And yet, instances of mass shooting continue to increase. More adults and children are being killed and injured. Families, neighborhoods, and communities are being disrupted. The news reports regarding the number of incidents that occurred just over the Independence Day weekend is troubling at best. More troubling may be the recent instances which have taken on a somewhat bizarre nature, suggesting that people who can legally buy a gun are not reluctant to use it however they may wish. The Hebrew prophets through whom God spoke to God's people would point out to them that this ongoing loss of life and limb is the price we pay, both sides pay, our whole society pays, for doing nothing about mass shootings. Recently, I came to a realization that I really needed to ask a question that perhaps I had been somewhat avoiding. And I did so through a spiritual exercise over the last Lenten season. The question was, what is God actually saying about, God's, about gun violence. During this last Lenten season, I engaged in a pilgrimage, a spiritual pilgrimage with a focus on gun violence. The process was simple and yet demanding. I began with a list of mass shootings from 1982 to 2023, in which three or more persons had been killed, assigning one to each day of the Lenten season, beginning with Ash Wednesday and ending with the day before Palm Sunday, starting with the lesser number of those killed and wounded and going on to the highest number. Each day, I recalled the details of that event and I prayed not only for its victims and families, but for the shooter and shared it with others online. And then I spent Holy Week from Palm Sunday to Easter even day listening, listening to what God wanted to tell me based upon those experiences. And finally, I prepared a report on the whole pilgrimage, which I thought might prove useful to others. That summary of the insights gained on the seven days of Holy Week and Easter Eve and day are far too lengthy to share this morning. But in preparing this sermon, I identified five as the most important messages I heard from God during my Lenten pilgrimage 2023. I offer these as five theological perspectives on gun violence. They are not strategic suggestions nor calls to action. They are not a plan for implementation intended to bring gun violence to an end. They are simply reflections, perspectives that any person of faith can bring to the table and share in any discussion of this topic its sources and solutions. What are the five? Number one, gun violence is a sin. It is not simply illegal, immoral, or unethical. It is a sin, an act of separation against God, humanity, society, the shooter, the victims, and their families. Now calling something a sin is not very popular today, even in churches. Some even say sin is no longer morally relevant. But calling gun violence a sin <clears throat> fulfills the role of the Hebrew prophet who declared to God's people when they had gone astray the price they paid 
for their actions. The sin of gun violence is not limited to the shooter. The manufacturer, seller, or provider of the firearms he uses is guilty as well. As is the official who grants him a license to own a gun he does not need, or anyone who ignores or contributes to the events that lead to his shooting, especially by, by ignoring. Every victim of gun violence, every person killed or injured, every family and community whose life is disrupt, disrupted, as well as the shooter himself, pays the wages of sin, death, especially in the light of any unwillingness effectively to do what could stop gun violence before it happens. Number two, believe it or not, the Second Amendment is not given by God. The Second Amendment of the United States Constitution is not the Eleventh Commandment given by God to Moses on Mount Sinai. It is part of a foundational document of our nation written by fallible men which is subject to interpretation and application, abuse and manipulation to fit a select group's agenda. We certainly have seen this to be true recently of other parts of the Constitution. The founders of our nation understood they were creating a flawed document, one which failed, for instance, to address the issue of slavery, and that it would need to be amended, changed in its content and meaning to fit the needs of the time. Only 10 of the original 12 proposed amendments were approved as a Bill of Rights. And since the adoption of the Constitution, a total of 33 changes have been proposed, but only 27 adopted, one actually to reverse another. And yet the Second Amendment, or at least part of it, is viewed by some in a manner that falls under the Ten Commandments prohibition against adultery. I'm not an adultery, interesting thought. Idolatry. <laughs> Treating as divine what was made by human hands. Three, the universe God created and humanity that dwells therein are all good and intended to be good by God. The Bible teaches that God created the universe and all that is in it and that all that God created was good. That includes humanity, men and women made in the image of God, forgiven by God, loved by God, made whole by God. What does a shooter see when he looks down the barrel of his gun at the adult or child whose life he's about to take? What does the victim see as he looks at the mouth of the gun being held by the man who's about to take his life? An anonymous, anonymous, worthless person, someone to be feared, or a child, a human being loved by God, whose life is a gift from God, whose future belongs to God. Jesus teaches us that God loves both the shooter and the victim, that both lives are valued, both have potentials yet to be realized. The universe God and the humanity God that dwells within it are and remain all good. And yet a troubling way of self-understanding has come into play where mass shootings are, are concerned. A, dom a dynamic we do not totally understand, yet one in which the shooter sees himself and his victim differently, freeing him to end the other's life. His moral compass changes, allowing him to see <clears throat> that what he is doing as his right and privilege. Gone is any sense of the human worth of anyone or everyone involved, replaced by an indiscriminate choice of victims by shooters who assume they will be killed during their rampage. And there's another aspect to this, a troubling aspect, and that is the, that the overwhelming majority 
of mass shooters are men. Out of a list of, I believe, 20, 124 mass shootings that I looked at, all of them were men except two. One was done by a couple, man and woman, and the other one was done by a woman. Why? What is there about the self-understanding that men have come to have, not given to them by God, but somehow self-motivated, that allows them to do those terrible acts without grievance or regret? Are their actions reflective of a self-identity as male human beings that allows them to see themselves and their victims not as human beings, but as something else, in contrast to how God sees them, how Jesus taught us to see them? Have we fostered an image of masculinity that convinces a man that being a mass shooter is justified? Does our self-understanding as men reflect the goodness of God's creation as opposed to an ability to destroy it? however self-justified or rational. Addressing gun violence must involve reversing how the self-understanding of humans, and especially of men, has been corrupted and needs to be replaced with one that reflects how God sees us in his love. Four, Jesus rejected the power of this world for that of God and his teachings and actions from the beginning to the end of his ministry, from his, his temptation in the wilderness to his cross, Jesus demonstrated an alternative existence, a reality envisioned in scripture and <clears throat> realizable in human life. In so doing, he denied much that constitutes our real world, including its concept of power, calling people to, of faith to live and a new reality. That reality is devoid of guns or mass shootings and rejects the power and the quest for power that so rules and dominates our lives today. The tempter offered Jesus the power of all the nations of the world. I've always wondered exactly how the devil came to own the power of the world. But the tempter offers Jesus the power of all the nation's world, and he refuses to accept it. The disciples sought to gain Jesus' freedom with a sword, and he rebuked them. Most solutions to gun violence reflect a perspective on the world which Jesus repudiates. What his followers bring to the table to any discussion of gun violence reflects the viewpoint he taught, embraced, demonstrated and empowered by his death on the cross. His upside down world is what he offered his followers then and now. And lastly, the post Easter experience perspective. But as the TV ad goes, there is more. When Jesus was raised from the dead, the power of that old world was broken and a new came into being. Whether it is called realized eschatology or just being Easter people, a new creation with new viewpoints, perspectives, possibilities, and reality emerged with Jesus from his empty tomb. As Isaiah says, a new world where there are no guns, Second Amendment, gun violence, shooters, or victims. Like the sculpture of old, all that he left for us to do was to chip away the old stone and let the new world emerge. Even among this tired old world of gun and violence, God calls people of faith to bring into its fullness the reality in which they already live. This theological perspective they will bring also to the table is rooted in and based on the new creation Jesus revealed when he rose from the dead that in which his Easter people live, and that from which all shall come to fulfillment as promised by God in the words he spoke through Isaiah. 
Now, the outline of this sermon says at this point, conclusion. And that was because at the time I didn't know how to end it. And I still don't, because it's not endable without action and a change of heart and a redirection of our lives. And so I will only end with a, one quote that really struck me as I was doing the research for this sermon. It's from a book called, by James E. Atwood called America and It's Gone, a Theological Exposé. And if I remember right, Rod, this guy's a Presbyterian. He writes, C.S. Lewis wrote, Christianity is a statement which, if false, is of no importance. And if it is true of infinite importance, the one thing it cannot be is moderately important. When violence and guns destroy the character and moral fiber of our nation, it is of infinite importance that the faith community boldly refutes the nonsensical messages of the gun on power, which proclaim guns do not kill, and the answer to gun violence is more guns.